Hello, everybody. I've been asked whether we're going to start on Berkeley time or on the, on the clock. And we only have an hour for what I think is going to be a very interesting discussion. So I'm going to kind of say, let's just go with the clock and get started. And we have some very, very interesting speakers here. I think I should mention at the outset that this is the 22nd homecoming event organized by the Center on Civility and Democratic Engagement. And I think many of you know that the center was founded by the class of 1968, and it resides at the Goldman School of Public Policy. What I'd like to do at the outset is introduce to you the newly, appreciate, uh, newly appointed director of the center, Dr. Meredith Saden. So uh, Meredith, I wonder if you could say a few words. I'll just hand you the mic. I don't mean to put you on the spot, but uh, <laughs> but I just <laughs> um, hello everyone. Thank you so much for joining us on this beautiful Saturday morning. Um, I am thrilled to be the newly appointed director um, of the Center on Civility and Democratic Engagement. Thank you so much uh, to Cal Class of 1968. I see some new faces, some familiar faces, um, and I just want to say how excited I am for this panel and also um, for continuing uh, the incredible legacy. Uh, of this center uh, that the class of 68 has uh, has started and founding it. So I will not take up any more of your time. Okay, thank you so much. I should mention that Meredith is a very distinguished political scientist at the Goldman School. And also you will note going forward that her work is regularly cited in the Washington Post, the New York Times, et cetera. So, so glad you're at the Goldman School. Uh, we know that uh, she's going to enhance the tradition of the, of the center to really uh, sponsor important public forums and also your consistent support of student research is, is, is greatly appreciated. Uh, today's topic is what does free speech look like at Berkeley after 60 years? First of all, I think a number of us in the audience are all kind of gasping at has it been 60 years? And then we, then we do the math, and in fact, it has been 60 years, which is even more shocking. Uh, but we've got a complex subject today. I think one of the things that strikes me is knowing this panel is coming up and all, I'm tearing articles out of, out of the paper and magazines. Uh, yes, okay, I'm being told by my wife of 56 years to put the microphone nearer my mouth, so I'll do that, so. Thank, thank you, Carolyn. So in any event, uh, we're very fortunate today to have three very distinguished panelists from different backgrounds. We have a campus administrator, a faculty member who is very much public, uh, focused on political discourse, and a student leader. So that's a, a, a pretty terrific combination. So. Uh, we've given some thought. The first speaker is going to be Dan Bogoloff, immediately to my left. He's Berkeley's assistant vice chancellor for executive communications. And at that, in that capacity, he has been a lead spokesman for the campus and provides the chancellor and other leaders uh, strategic counsel. Anyone here want that job? I mean, that's, that, that, I think that's about as tough as it gets. And I've had firsthand experience to work with Dan involved bringing speakers to campus and the like. And he does an absolutely uh, spectacular job. In the interest of time, I think I'll go immediately to Dan and introduce the other speakers after their time. And I'll give you a one minute notice if you're pushing up against this tight timeline uh, we're faced with. Thanks, Dick, and thanks everybody for being here. Um, so I'll start out with a few declarative statements, and then we can unpack that later. First, there is an inherent tension between the First Amendment and what it takes to have a cohesive community on a university campus where everyone can feel safe, respected, and a true sense of belonging, number one. Number two, people, most people have no idea how radical our Constitution is. I would be a millionaire if I had a dollar for every time I've heard in the last few years, no, Dan, the Constitution doesn't protect hate speech. The Constitution protects hateful, toxic speech 
It even protects advocacy for violence. And just let that sink in for a second. Which means that as a university, we cannot censor, sanction, or prevent hateful, toxic, threatening speech. Which means that the only way that you can address that inherent tension is through voluntary means about the community being ready to stand up, some critical mass of that community, being ready to stand up and say, no, we will not accept this. To stand up in defense of the university's uh, principles of community, which call for respect for differences, for civil discourse, for diversity of perspective, for free speech, for all of those things. They are principles, but they're not rules. And where this sort of, and, and I always think of something that Carol Christ, former Chancellor Carol Christ used to say, just because you have the right to say something doesn't mean it's the right thing to say. But how do we get an 18-year-old or a 22-year-old or a 35-year-old activist who believes deeply in their own position and the righteousness of that position to take that into account, to in effect hold themselves back when they feel so deeply and passionately about the cause they're advocating for or the actions they may protest against? How do we get an 18, 35, 45 or so on activist to take into account the needs of the community of which they are a part and give them a place in their order of priorities alongside their right to exercise their First Amendment rights? So just in case there's any skeptics about what I'm saying, this really devolves to a large extent from a case called the Brandenburg case. I'm not an attorney, but I've been schooled by our law school dean, um, Erwin Chemerinsky, who literally wrote the book, Free Speech on Campus. He's an amazing source of counsel and support for all that the university does around free speech. But the case, the case is the Brandenburg case, and I think it was adjudicated by the Supreme Court in the 1970s. There was a leader of the Ku Klux Klan who got up in front of a crowd and basically said, we need to send all black people back to Africa. We need to send all the Jews to Israel. And we need to use violence to do that. And law enforcement, I think it was in Ohio, said, well, you can't say that. And the Supreme Court said, oh, yes, you can. So there's only two real cutouts. And this will be the last thing, and then I'll... I'll shut up for now. Um, actually, a couple other. How much time do I, do I have? A, okay. I got free speech. Um, and yeah, and, and so there's really only two cutouts. One of them is incitement, that the it, speech is not protected if it creates an imminent threat of violence. So I can have a general call for violence. All green people should die. But what I can't say is all green people should die. And come on, everybody, let's go up to the frat house where all the green people live. I'm moving into action. I'm inciting violence. I'm creating an imminent threat of violence. The second is what's called true threat. So I can say again, all green people must die. But I can't say all green people must die, including that green person right there an identifiable individual, the bar is so high. And even if an institution, particularly a public institution, and make no mistake, the rules we operate under are somewhat different than they are for private universities, um, but we can't head that off at the pass. That's called prior restraint. And almost never will a court grant an institution prior restraint saying, in effect, we are pretty sure that there's going to be some incitement here, so we're going to shut this thing down. The courts are like, no, no. You can have police there ready to shut that down if there's incitement or true threat, but prior restraint, almost never. In my 20-year career at Cal, I've dealt with now, and we're in the middle of the second, two major, like their eras of challenge and tumult around the First Amendment. The first was in 2017, launched by the appearance of Milo Yiannopoulos, 
For those of you who don't remember, he was a highly toxic, highly provocative, I don't know if it was right wing or, or insane wing. I mean, it, it's hard to categorize him. But he, hate, you know, he called fem feminism a cancer on society, and he hated immigrants, and he hated people of color. What he really loved was selling books and getting social media attention. And he was coming here, and an incredible number of people, staff, faculty, and students, thought it was absolutely fine to not just advocate for violence, but to engage in violence to shut him down. The heckler's veto. It was shocking, shocking. We had faculty members who were like, no, he has no right to say those things. And even if he does, there's a higher moral purpose here. And it sent us spinning into a major crisis. Uh, Chancellor Chris called a full year of education around free speech. And we thought, we said, okay, we're good to go. Well, we weren't. Um, in the wake of October 17th, we have an entire, uh, October 7th, in what's called the conflict around the conflict in Gaza and the Middle East, we have a relatively new situation because it pits student on student, faculty member on faculty member, people who believe deeply in their positions, issues that touch people's core identities, not an abstract political belief. And the speech and the rhetoric has, is so toxic, what's happening, we can't stop it, we can't prevent it, we can't sanction it. So we have to turn to cultural change. Um, and it's, it's really, really, it's a difficult period. Last thing, what makes it all the more difficult is the Department of Education through the Office of Civil Rights. So let me back up. Title VI says that, um, makes it illegal for any event or even expression if it creates a situation whereby a student, because of harassment or discrimination, cannot access the educational resources of the university. And the Office of Civil Rights has said, said to us, universities around the country, in a dear colleague letter, just because speech is protected doesn't let you off the hook when it comes to responding to it. Oh, geez. How does that work? And this university, like many universities, is still trying to navigate those shoals. Sometimes it's just a matter of putting out a message of condemnation. Sometimes it's a matter of telling students, look, we know that this speech is creating some peril around your ability to access the, the educational resources, so we're going to support you with X, Y, and Z. But that path is still not a clear one. So that's just a little bit of the landscape. Um, I want Perfect. To I want to defer to the others, and we'll take questions and get the discussion going. Great. Thank you. And I think uh, you provided an excellent context for this discussion. And the main thing that went through my mind as you were talking about is, wow, this stuff is really complicated. It is really complicated. And I'm, I, I keep tremendously thick files on a lot of these subjects. And so in preparation for this, I went through my free speech files and I came across almost a special section, uh, almost a special section of the uh, New York Times Sunday Magazine. Interestingly, it was published four years ago, almost to the day. And it talked about the issues of free speech, but it reinforced a lot of these points that you're talking about of, you know, I, I was stunned at the extent to which free speech, I, I'm sorry, hate speech is protected and the like. Also, I'm really glad we're having this discussion today. And it's one of a, a kind of a continuing number of panels and discussions on the Berkeley campus. And there was a great one a month ago where uh, Erwin Sherman, Sherman, how do I pronounce that Chemerinsky. correctly? Chemerinsky, the Dean of Berkeley Law spoke. And also on the panel with him was Nadine Stressen, who was the president of the ACLU. And she, there was a great deal of discussion kind of defining free speech and the like. And Nadine made a point that I really, it really resonated with me, in which she said, there is a constitutional right to free speech. There is not a constitutional right to disruption. 
And that's the thing of maybe we get into the discussion that has bothered me. I graduated, you know, years ago. Carol and I moved to the East Coast. We moved back. We've been back here for 20 years, and I think disruption has been the thing which has bothered me a great deal. I've been to numerous events on the Berkeley campus where people are literally prevented from speaking. I mean, they're kind of shouted down with obscenities and the like. Anyway, perhaps we could discuss that a little bit of what are the tools the university has to deal with that. But what I'd like to do now is introduce our second speaker, who is Dr. Darren Zook. He has taught at Berkeley for over 20 years. His areas of interest include comparative <laughs> politics, human rights, international law, cybersecurity. Uh, but most importantly, he also teaches a course every year at Berkeley on political discourse course in the 21st century. And this course is aimed at undergraduate students in a nonpartisan exploration of an inquiry into the constructive and transformative power, power of civic engagement in modern democratic politics. And I might add that I have heard from many people that this course is so popular that there's a tremendous sentiment on campus that, that should, it should be a required course for freshmen in letters and science. So turn to you for your perspective on what's it like on campus these days. It's fun. Uh, <laughs> good morning, everyone. And uh, hello to all those watching through live stream. Uh, what's it like on campus today in terms of free speech? Um, I would best characterize it this way, and I, and I don't know, I can't pin out exactly when this transformation happened. Uh, clearly things got much worse around 2016, 2017. Dan mentioned the uh, debacle with Milo Yiannopoulos being on campus. The slippage that I see, and this is a profound slippage, is the confusion or the slippage that goes from concentrating on hate speech and turning that into speech we hate to hear and thinking they're the same thing. That in essence, we now confuse hurt speech with hate speech. Hate speech is already protected, we know that. Hurt speech is, is, a, is a far lesser thing. Not that hurting people is, is not a big deal, but the problem is, is the, this push to get rid of hurt speech as hate speech has in fact created this drive for disruption this drive for censoring people who voice opinions that we don't want to hear. We hate to hear them. And this is a, a huge drift away from the original principles of the free speech movement that we had on campus. Now, one of the things that drives this, this movement towards disruption, and I agree, there is no right to disruption, is can be traced back to, to philosopher Karl Popper's idea of what's called the liberal paradox. And some of you know this, and many all maybe all of you know this, but the liberal paradox says, in essence, that because liberals are tolerant, the one thing that would undermine the principles of tolerance and liberalism is intolerance. And so to make liberalism what it should be, we have to not tolerate intolerance. We have to be intolerant of intolerance. Now, the thing about a paradox is that a paradox actually by design doesn't resolve. If you know Zeno's paradox, which is the, the one where uh, if I'm going to walk to the wall first, I have to get halfway there, then half to hat and, and halfway, halfway, halfway. And eventually I'll never reach the wall. If you want to test that paradox, please run full speed at that wall because you will hit it. So the liberal paradox, a paradox doesn't resolve. It, what it means is, is we do have to tolerate intolerance. That's why hate speech is legally protected. So this drive for the idea that anybody voicing an opinion that hurts anyone else, and this is even true for comedy. Comedy is one of the most protected forms of speech we have. But the idea of saying comedians can tell certain kinds of jokes, people can't say certain kinds of things, and if they do, I have to go there, I have to shout it down so that no one can hear it, is, is a development that is very disturbing. It's here on Berkeley's campus, it's here on all college campuses. So Dan referenced the idea that, you know, how can we improve the situation? We, and he mentioned cultural change. We have a word for that. 
The word that embodies the rules that we make as opposed to a government imposes on us or an administration imposes on it, that's by definition what civility is. And what civility asks of us, civility puts a burden on all of us, puts a responsibility on all of us. And that responsibility is for us not to just tolerate what is different from what we believe, but in fact, to strive to understand it on its own terms. One of the ways I like to put this, and I'm going to borrow from a term that comes from a very different debate, is civility in essence requires us in the course of civil discourse to be ideologically non-binary. It's not an either or. It can't be a situation where I believe I'm right, so if you don't agree with me, you must be wrong. Wrong speech is hate speech. Hate speech is hurt speech. Therefore, I have to shut it down. That is the wrong way to look at this. And I'll give you, I'll end here with a, a little thought exercise, because what we have is in many ways a, a, a secular true believer problem. I know I'm right, and I want rightness to prevail because rightness fights for justice, and therefore I have to silence what is wrong, which is a very unliberal opinion, by the way. So imagine a situation where a group of Christians went to a mosque to shout down the imam at that mosque during Friday prayer. Why are you doing this? Because we know that religion is wrong. How do you know that religion is wrong? Because I know my religion is right. How do you know your religion is right? Because I read this Christian book that told me so. It's right there in the New Testament. Have you read the Quran? Why would I read falsehood? That doesn't sound very tolerant, does it? It sounds like, wow, that sounds like bigotry in action. So how do you want that conversation to actually go? With the new believer problem, we have the new missionary problem. I have to convert you to my point of view because my point of view is the right one. We wouldn't accept that with religion. What we want, what civility requires is, I might not convert to your religion, but I do want to understand it because that's the only way we can develop the rules that allow both of us to speak in a way that cultivates civility. I agree with Dan completely on the idea of recreating culture. And if we could do something like that on Berkeley's campus, we can find a way back to the promise and potential of what the free speech movement was 60 years ago. Any questions on that? I'll hear from you later, but I'll end my comments with that. Thank you very much, Darren. Uh, I'm going to mention that, uh, yeah, we. I think some index cards have been passed out for people to write questions, and I don't know if any have been filled out yet, but maybe you could bring them up to me, and I'll, uh, I'll kind of sift through those. One of the reasons for the cards is if I want to look through them and see if there's any particular themes that many people are raising, so I would prioritize that. But it, also, we want to take uh, questions from the floor as well. Uh, anyway, I, our, our last speaker is Samantha Dalton. She's a senior at Berkeley, double majoring in philosophy and political science with a focus on international relations. Her interests lie in political violence and psychology and their intersection on domestic and global levels. She has an impressive resume, including, including serving as the co-president of Bridge USA's Berkeley chapter, also president of Berkeley Legal Studies Association, and editor-in-chief of the California Legal Studies Journal, and writes for the Berkeley Political Review. Very impressive uh, list of accomplishments. I wonder, by the way, Samantha, in your remarks, if you could tell us all a bit more about Bridge USA, I mean, I think it's a very interesting concept that I'm going to guess that many of the people in the audience don't know what it is. So I hope you could touch upon that. And also, I'm very interested in what you perceive as the true mood on campus these days. Uh, are we in the midst of a crisis or is this just another inevitable bump in the road at one of the nation's most dynamic universities? it over to you and thank you for being here yeah of course um wow i don't know how i'm gonna follow these guys up <laughs> um so yeah i'll start off by telling you all a little bit about bridge usa um i've been involved with bridge usa for about two years now um i started off as just a general member and then i moved into um, an events coordinator position for about a semester 
Um, and then I very quickly moved up into a co-president position. Um, and I worked with our national organization over the summer, finding um, students on other campuses that don't have Bridge USA chapters that want to start Bridge USA chapters on their campus um, and helping them start those chapters. Um, and this will be my last year serving as um, co-president of my uh, chapter here at Berkeley. Um, so a little bit about Bridge USA. We started in 2017 on the Berkeley campus. Um, we started after what is referred to now um, by a lot of students um, as the Milo riots. Um, <laughs> so we, our founders, Manu Meal and Ross Irwin are both Berkeley alums and they're still with the organization today serving as CEO and COO. So they kind of just followed it all the way up. Um, after all of the events or rather during the events, um, that happened in 2017, there were a probably a small group of students that quickly turned into a very large group of students who kind of saw what was going on on campus and saw how students were treating each other and the violence that broke out and really just said, there has to be another way. We can't continue doing this. We can't just turn to violence when we disagree with something or with someone. Um, and so that's really kind of the idea that Bridge USA was born out of. Um, it started, like I said, with a very small group of individuals who believed that there was a better way to talk about politics and social, social issues. Um, and it very, very quickly grew into a much larger organization. Um, I believe now we have over 65 chapters nationwide. Um, it's even, bridge, the idea of Bridge USA has even gone international. There's um, chapters in Europe, there's chapters in Africa, there's interest in starting chapters in Mexico as well. Um, so it's not necessarily just um, a thing that's happening in the US, but rather on an international scale as well. Um, and we've even expanded to start op opening up some chapters on high school campuses as well. Um, we have about 25 chapters on high school campuses, and that number is growing very rapidly um, as well. Um, I kind of now want to turn a little bit towards the sentiment that I'm seeing on campus as a student um, surrounding free speech. So. In the days or weeks um, leading up to this panel, I really wanted to talk to a lot of students on campus to make sure that I would accurately represent what not only myself, my own, not only my thoughts, but also the thoughts of other students as well. Um, and so I was talking to a lot of students on campus about what they thought about free speech in general. Um, and there seems to be about a 50-50 divide on the idea of hate speech and whether hate speech is free speech. Um, about half of the students that I spoke to believe that hate speech is free speech and that you can, that you shouldn't use hate speech, but that you are allowed to. Um, and the other half of the students that I spoke to kind of use the classic example of, well, you can't yell fire in a crowded movie theater. So you shouldn't be able to say um, hateful things to an, a group of individuals or just one singular individual based on things that they can't change about themselves. Um, so those were the kind of, those were the two perspectives that I got from students. Um, but the most interesting thing that I heard from a lot of students, an overwhelming amount of the students that I spoke to, um, was that I asked them, do you think that the university is censoring your ability to use free speech on campus, given everything that's going on in the last year since October 7th? And they actually said, no, I don't think the university is censoring my ability to use free speech. I don't think they're censoring me at all. And instead they said, I think I'm self-censoring myself because I'm scared of sharing my opinion with other people. I'm scared of what's gonna happen to me if I say what I believe. And 
that was a really interesting concept um, for me at least. And once I kind of heard that from a lot of students, I started noticing it all over campus. Um, even in our chapters discussions, we host weekly discussions that are about an hour long on Tuesdays. Um, and we cover a wide variety of topics. Um, even in our own discussions, there were times where I could see students that wanted to speak, that wanted to raise their hand and share their opinion. Um, but for some reason were kind of refraining from doing so. Um, and I think that we are in a very similar situation that we were, um, in 2017. We're kind of, at least from my point of view, we're kind of seeing the cycle be completed and we're kind of back where we were in 2017. Um, and maybe Dan and Darren can speak a little bit more about their thoughts on that. Um, but from at least my point of view, I think we're at a very similar spot that we were in 2017 when Bridge USA was formed. Um, at least from my chapter's perspective, we are working really hard to host a lot of discussions and events this semester to kind of bring people in to work on constructive dialogue, constructive and respectful dialogue on campus to provide safe spaces for students to feel like they can speak freely and share their opinions um, on current and any really social and political issues um, that are going on. Um, and in general, I would just say to wrap up, um, I do, I agree. I think we need to have, um, a change in culture, not only, um, on campus, but in general, in the U S we need to have a change in culture. We need to be more empathetic towards each other. We need to be more open-minded. We need to say, okay, maybe I don't agree with you, but at least I understand where you're coming from now and you have a different opinion and that's okay. Um, and I think we just in general, yeah, I think we just need to be, um, more understanding, I would say. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I really appreciate everyone's perspective, which I think are, are quite enlightening. Uh, also, I want to thank you, everyone in the audience for writing out questions. And I might add, they're very good questions. And so what I'm trying to do is bunch them together and I'm going to, put them into kind of categories which I think are appropriate for each of the panelists. So I'm going to start out uh, with Darren and give you three questions and let you respond in any way. That's why you're a professor. You know how to deal with these issues. So it's uh, Professor Zook, can you help us understand how your ideas about liberalism would help us navigate uh, current pro-Palestinian protests here at Berkeley. How can valid critiques be heard? The next question is, how do we reconcile a constitution built for a white power structure and expecting marginalized communities to agree to operate by those rules? And the last one is the point that I alluded to that there's considerable sentiment, and I certainly understand this, to make your course a requirement. Someone asked from the audience that Stanford has a course, uh, maybe mandatory, for undergraduates on civil, dis on civil dialogue. This person is not sure of what the exact title is. Uh, should we have something similar? And so I wonder, uh, from my standpoint, it sounds like a great idea, but also, you, in addition to Stanford, I don't know other, how are other campuses dealing with this? Is your kind of a one-off here at Berkeley other than Stanford, or are many campuses trying to address these issues? And do I have like three seconds to answer these questions? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to give you the questions if you need a, if you Thank need you. a refresher. I'll start with the, the last one's the easiest one. Um, as we all know, Berkeley just does it best. But aside from that... Um, I don't know. I know other college campuses are struggling with this, as we all saw from the last year. Some of them did better than others. I mean, in, in spite of all the protests we had last spring, I, I think Berkeley did probably the finest job of any of the major university campuses with trying to negotiate the the, the very tense climate on on uh, stage. But I would, I you know, I would love it if I if I could open my class up to. 
you know, I, I feel weird saying I want my class to be required, but I would love to open it up to as many students who want to take it because I think it is a valuable education. I mean, that's the classroom. What Samantha's doing is more of a civil society reinforcement of that. So, um, yeah, Stanford does have a class. Uh, it has a smaller student body, but we can have one or more classes, and I think it would be a great idea to have it be a required class that you have to take before you leave Berkeley. Uh, the constitutional question, really quickly, there's a debate about, you know, we can sit here all, you know, all afternoon about whether the Constitution was uh, a document of white supremacy or whether it was a document of, of a radical document uh, for, for what became progressive law. That's not really what the question is getting at. However, regardless of the, what the Constitution was written for, it doesn't mean that we can't rewrite the social contract, which ties us to that Constitution. Because that original social contract excluded a number of groups, either because they weren't here or because they were considered to be outside of the realm of society. So nothing prevents the U.S. from having all of us sit down and say, let's rewrite that social contract together so the Constitution does apply to everyone and the people feel it applies to them equally. That's just called reestablishing the rule of law. Uh, the last one was it was a tough one. How, you know, in terms of uh, it was. Think something about how can we apply the, the the tools of liberalism to the protests that have happened since October 7th. It's a big question. Uh, I will say this. Uh, I, I frequently, when, when I talk about liberalism, I say to this, I say, we're doing liberalism wrong. Even those of us who think we are liberals. Liberalism as a political philosophy has always been, liberalism was never conceived as the opposite of conservatism. Liberalism was always meant to be an alternative to conservatism, which includes us contemplating and considering conservative viewpoints. So, so to go to the heart of the question, no matter how contentious any issue is, including conflicts in the Middle East, there has to be a pathway to get to a civil discourse about it. And there is, and I know there is, and I would never shy away from trying to start one. So liberalism has the toolkit. We just need to do liberalism better. That's the way I'd put that. By the way, uh, I should mention uh, we, the Middle East is kind of a thread through a lot of the discussions and the issues on campus. I, one thing I didn't mention in his introduction is that Dan was the bureau chief for C, uh, CBS in Tel Aviv for a, a, a number of years. So this is a, these are an interesting time for yeah. you on, on both fronts. Uh, anyway, I have a couple of questions for you, Dan, in that regard. Uh, what, is, what is the uh, campus's ability to regulate the time, place, and manner of speech? And how do you do it? How can you do it? How do you... Uh, yeah. Given the complexities. So just so everybody knows, um, we've been talking about free speech, but an institution like UC Berkeley has the ability to impose what are called time, place, and manner rules. And what they do is ensure that the exercise of free speech rights don't impinge on the rights of others who may not want to participate in a protest, who may just want to go to class. Um, and also time, place, and manner rules protect the smooth operations of the university whether it's administrative operations or academic, and meaning there's limits. And time, place, and manner would be, you know, you can't walk into a theater and yell fire. Um, you're creating precarity. You're, you're creating danger. So we do have the ability to establish limits, in the, and, you know, they have to be content neutral. Um, okay, so how do you enforce them? Well, first of all, again, there's so many layers of complexity here. We have guidance from the University of California system. It's called the Robinson Edley, uh, the Robinson Edley Guidelines. They were developed after 2008 in the wake of that terrible incident at UC Davis. And uh, though some of you may remember, there were students sitting and protesting, and a police officer walked along, spraying them with I don't forget what it was, um, tear gas or something, and there was an understandable uproar about what happened, and we're now told that if it's campus rules, including time, place, and manner that are being violated, we are only to call police as a last resort if there's a distinct threat to life safety and the well-being of members of the campus community. 
So we have to address violation of rules different than we do violation of the law. But let's take an example. Dick and I were both at the Condoleezza, there was a speaking event with Condoleezza Rice and Carol Crisp. There were protesters who got up and disrupted the event. The audience went nuts. There was booing. That sort of social condemnation had no impact whatsoever. And eventually they petered out and they were ushered out. But it happened a few times, and I remember Dick and I talking, he was really upset. And I said, I understand, I was there too, I was upset as well, but what to do? Bring in police, we're gonna have to shut down the whole event. There's no way police are wading into a crowd of a couple of hundred people with 10, 15 activists who are likely to resist um, because of the safety threat that would result from the police trying to arrest these people. That's a really, really hard decision. And it's a classic decision and a classic dilemma for the university about time, place, and manner. Let's take another example, Sather Gate. We've seen since October 7th, over and over, protests blocking part of Sather Gate. And usually it's um, pro-Palestinian demonstrators who are there. They engage in speech protected by the First Amendment, which is highly disturbing to other members of the community who don't share their perspectives. Strictly speaking, when they put up a sign attached to, attached to Sather Gate, they're breaking the rules. People say you should enforce the rules. And then our lawyers say, ah, not so fast. We've had protests at Sather Gate for the last 50 years. We've had other protests that have attached things to the gate, and we did nothing. We had union, labor-related protests there, and we did nothing. We can't now start to treat this protest differently simply because, and this is hard to hear, simply because it's having a negative impact on other members of the community. We have to be content neutral. So... We received directives from the president of the UC system about cracking down, about less tolerance, about time, place, and manner. We've been instructed to move quickly and to be, again, in a content-neutral way. But then we reach another level of complexity that's not always obvious from the outside looking in. If we act against activists, if we condemn an activist, what does a 20-year-old activist do when they're condemned or acted against? Do they back down or double down? We know what the right answer is. Almost invariably, they'll double down to the detriment of the very community we're trying to protect. So this is just another level of complexity around time, place, and manner. We're feeling our way through this right now. In a little bit because Dan and I have talked about this over time and he's right. I was at the uh, Condoleezza Rice event and I was appalled by it quite honestly because it wasn't just one disruption and I, I knew disruption was coming. There was no question it was going to be there. So I had my notepad out and I had a pen and I had my watch. I said, okay, okay, there's going to be a shit storm here. And how is it going to play out? And it was clearly that it had been planned in advance. There was a disruption every five minutes. So if it, the event went from 11 till noon, every five minutes someone stood up. And it was, I'll spare you some of the language, but they're yelling at Condoleezza Rice, former Secretary of State of the United States, provost at Stanford, you're an effing war criminal. I mean, screaming it. And then... What blew me away after this diatribe, it was, uh, it, it just got to go on and said, and here's my eight-year-old daughter here listening to all this. I thought, what? <laughs> you're calling her an effing war criminal? And then you're, you know, how upsetting it is that you brought your eight-year-old daughter here. And it made me thought of Bill Maher's remark. Uh, you may remember that Maher was invited to give a commencement address here, and then he was disinvited. And Dan, to his great credit, helped us navigate this, and this, this talk went well and all that. But on his HBO show that week, Dan Mogoloff, Dan Mogoloff, you know, <laughs> I don't know if that wasn't Freudian or not, but anyway, the... Uh, 
Mar gets up there and he's talking about if he's invited, but he's unclear whether he's invited or not, but he is, he would come if he wasn't, if the invitation stood. And then he said, this also happens to be the 50th anniversary of the free speech movement at Berkeley. And he paused for a moment and said, I guess they don't teach irony at Berkeley. And I, I thought it was a pretty precise remark. But the issue to me was, first of all, I agree with you, Dan, you don't call the police in in a situation like that. The worst thing in the world would be to have armed, you know, not armed, but uniformed police officers come and dragging people away. But I think where we might have a divergence is my feeling there has to be consequences for that disruption. And you correctly, and I, I totally agree with this, if you tried to sanction those students, have consequences for it, it would drag on for a year, and somewhere along the line, it would peter out. So I wonder if you could just speak to that of the difficulties of how do you have consequences for students which are clearly violating concepts of free speech? Yeah, so um, it's a really, really difficult question. Um, our student affairs staff, we're, we're understaffed in terms of police. The other day we had some challenges. It Thank turned you. out we had eight uniformed officers on the, in the entire campus. There's staffing issues around the, around the country, around the Bay Area. Also, our student affairs staff, understandably, see their main mission is supporting students. They're reluctant to get involved in discipline, to be the ones meeting out con consequences. We have a student conduct office, but folks, I'm telling you, the student conduct process in this country is broken. And again, another layer of complexity, not obvious from the outside looking in. The courts have ruled that students, I, I think it's at all universities, but definite public, have a property right to their education. And therefore, the levels of due process we have to go through before we suspend or expel a student can take up to a year, a year. And invariably, if we decide to suspend a student, they go to an outside court, the decision gets overturned. There is almost no deterrent ability that we have through the, stu the student conduct process. There are lesser punishments but again, this is, this is something that can take a long time. But having said that, this is a live issue on campus right now. We are actually planning on hiring new staff whose sole job will be beginning to hand out citations when student code of conduct is violated. We understand that we have to do a better job in terms of intermediate consequences that are short of suspension or expulsion. Um, we have to find ways to kind of shorten the due process that we have to go through right now. But we have struggled with that. I'll, I'll just say it straight out. We have struggled imposing appropriate consequences in a timely fashion that actually do what they're supposed to do, which is deter behavior that is contrary to the rules of the campus and the mores of the community. Um, but it's a, it's a really difficult issue, and it's one that, that we, we really continue to struggle with, but we haven't thrown our hands up in the air. Thank you very much. Uh, Samantha, I have a number of questions which I'd like to kind of package for you, uh, which is basically give us a reality check of what it's like to be a Berkeley student these days. I think we all get phone calls from all around the United States saying, what's it like there? If you're, you're a Jewish student, are you intimidated? Are you, do you fear physical violence and the like? And to kind of I have, uh, Carolyn and I have two granddaughters that are at Berkeley High School, and I've asked them the same kind of question because there's, it's a controversial issue in high schools as well. And I said, how do you feel about expressing your opinion? And both of them said, there is no way where they had expressed their opinion about, you know, Palestine and everything that's going on in Israel. I said, it's an absolute no-win proposition. You would be you'd be assaulted from both sides and condemned and your life made miserable. And I'm aware of a, the granddaughter of another friend who's, uh, whose granddaughter left Berkeley High School after her freshman year because she was just being, you know, called out in so many inappropriate ways. So again, I wonder if you could kind of share your thoughts as a student. I mean, it, I guess, you, and there's, 
there's being a student in two things. There's a student in the classroom where you express your point of view, and then also talking to your roommates or, you know, social friends and the like. Yeah. Um, I'll say I was taking, um, in the spring semester, last spring semester, I was taking Professor Hasner's um, class on war in the Middle East, um, which was a very interesting time to be taking that class. Um, And I'll say as far as in the classroom, um, we had surprisingly less disruptions than I thought we would. Um, especially in that class, given that Professor Hasner um, is involved with the, um, I believe it's the Jewish Studies Department, or um, I think he's involved with um, that department on campus, um, and he's teaching that that course as well. So I thought we would have more disruptions than we did. Um, I'll say that in the classroom, I've talked to a lot of students who find it um, distracting when, when other students come in and they're wearing, um, they're wearing Palestinian scarves or they're wearing things that represent either side. They find it a little bit distracting. Um, but I think that's the extent of, in, of like disruptions that happen in the classroom. Um, as far as just on campus, um, there seems to be two groups. Um, there's students who want to be involved in the conversation and there's students who want to be left alone and want to just go to class. They just want to study, do their thing. That's all they want to do. Um, I've talked to a lot of um, Israeli and Jewish students who have said that they don't feel safe on campus, uh, specifically in the fall and spring semesters of last year. There were students who that I knew who didn't come to campus for a month at a time because they just did not feel safe on campus. Um, they stayed in their dorms, they stayed in their apartments, they emailed their professors and worked out some sort of way that they could still complete assignments and get the materials that they needed to get. Um, but they basically said, I don't want to be on campus. I don't feel safe on campus. I don't want to walk across campus and see all of these protests every day because it's tiring. It's emotionally taxing. And I can't do it on top of the workload that comes with being a Berkeley student. Um, So in a sense, they kind of stepped away from being a student on Berkeley's campus. Um, And then there were more extreme cases that I had heard about um, from friends um, and people, students that this actually had happened to that when uh, right after October 7th happened, um, Jewish students that were being doxxed and people leaving hateful messages on their dorm room doors, um, threats. And even in Professor Hasner's class, there was a note that was left on our classroom door that said, and I don't remember exactly what the phrasing was, but it basically said, you need to stop teaching your class or else. Um, And so it has taken quite a step, I would say. I don't, I've never experienced anything like this before. It seems currently to have settled down from that, at least from my perspective. Um, There are still demonstrations going on and there are still students who are who don't want to be involved in what's going on on campus, but in some sense kind of get dragged into it. Um, And so that's kind of the student experience that's going on right now. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I wasn't really prepared for this, but there was a question directed to me, so I'll uh, uh, make, make an effort to address it. Uh, and it's what challenges did you face on campus as the AACC president? Uh, another one was uh, what advice would you give to students? to current student activists. Two quick points. The thing that bothered me most going back to the 60s was how things were so polarized and you, there was a demand for purity on an issue. 
I, someone could agree with you 90% of the time. And if you disagreed on one point, there was, there was hell to pay. So that was something that I think was unfortunate there. At the same time, a thing which I felt was very positive, I felt there, and some of you may want to address this and disagree, that there was tolerance for other people's opinion. I did not see a lot of disruption and the like. And I'll give us an example. I worked hard to bring a lot of speakers to campus, MLK, Robert Kennedy, maybe another 10 or so. But one of the ones which was most impressed me about Berkeley was John Tower, a very conservative Republican senator from Texas spoke. He spoke on the sprawl hall steps, maybe a little rope in front of him, students right up to the rope, and there was no disruption whatsoever. And I just say, if Ted Cruz came to the Berkeley campus today and was going to, you get the point. So that's a concern. And so that would be my advice is tolerance to hear other people's point of view. Now, there's a good question here as well, uh, which I think I'm going to get out there. Maybe I'll throw this open to everybody. Uh, it was tempted to Dan, but isn't the point of protest dis disruption uh, in order to bring attention to a genocide or a gross injustice uh, is, is not that tolerable? So I wonder if anyone wants to speak to that. And also, uh, I was concerned about this. I think we could go on for an awfully long time. We're up against the 11 o'clock timeline, but I think we have maybe a five or 10 minutes of space here until they take us out. After they've uh, spoken to this point about, hey, yes, disruption is the point to get attention to things. If anyone wants to speak to that. and then. Maybe I'll just open it to the floor if anyone just wants to make a comment about any of this, as opposed to me trying to, you know, guide us through it. So I'll come to you right after they speak to this point about the disruption. Yeah. Uh, I'll be real quick because I know we're running out of time. So to go back to one of the questions that was directed at me earlier about how can we use these liberal principles to to negotiate discussions about, uh, you know, Israel, Palestine. One of the things that I like to do is is to bypass the conflict by going to the tactics, which is, OK, I see you're protesting on campus. You know, what is your end goal? What do you want to happen? Do you want to change minds? Do you want to call attention? And now you're having a discussion. I don't have to tell you where I stand on this conflict. Now it's like, oh, I want to change minds. Do you really think blocking Souther Gate? Do you think yelling at people? Is that going to change a mind? And you suddenly have a very civil discourse about what the point of this is. And I found that 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 always seems to work. And so, yes, disruption to a certain extent is part of the Berkeley tradition. We have, you know, protest every day about something. I'm waiting for us to have a protest that we don't have enough protests. That would be so Berkeley. Um, but I find if you ask people, what exactly are you hoping to get? You know, if you say you're fighting for justice, what would that justice look like? It turns into a very fruitful discussion mm -hmm. because you're not talking about the conflict anymore. You're talking about what do you want you know, at, the, at the end of your struggle? And I find that works very well. Yeah, I, I, disruption, I mean, clearly, clearly it is the goal and the objective of some people who protest. And you can say that even during the civil rights era, you know, take sitting in the front of the bus was disruptive to some of the people. That's civil di disobedience. But with civil disobedience comes consequences. And that's something the freedom fighters understood. That's something that the anti-war protesters understood. Um, but time after time, we see in modern society that in the wake of civil disobedience, the first demand of the people engaging in it is there should be no consequences, right? We're only going to end what we're doing unless you promise we, there will be no, no consequences. So, you know, if you cross that line from simply advocating what you believe in, protesting against what you abhor, and then it becomes influencing the actual life of someone else, fine, that can be your objective. But we can't have an institution of higher education if there aren't consequences for that, because there is that line between my rights and your rights. 
And I'm not infringing on your rights if I'm just blah, 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 blah. But when I begin to influence how you can carry out your life, what you can do, where you can go, there have to be consequences. And then we're challenged when it comes to consequences. Yeah, I've heard this sentiment a lot from um, a lot of the people that have been protesting or involved in protesting groups um, that, well, the point of protest is to make people uncomfortable. Otherwise, it's not an effective protest. Um, and I can understand their point of view. Um, I think it takes it a step beyond, um, just a protest when things start to become violent and when, um, people start to become targeted as individuals. Um, I think that takes it a step too far. And I agree with what Dan was saying is, um, if, if you are going to put yourself in that situation, then you have to be ready to face whatever consequences come your way. And in my own opinion, you should be willing to accept those consequences. If you really, truly so deeply feel the way that you do, then you should be willing to accept those consequences, um, whether you think that they are right or not right. I want to add something that I think we can't forget about. We are not isolated. We're not an ivory tower at Berkeley. We're not isolated from the world around us. We're susceptible and porous to all sorts of societal pathologies. Social media, where there's actually an incentive to be toxic and divisive, where the collapse of news sites, where students are going to sites who aren't informing them. There's sites that look like news sites that are simply saying, you're right, you're right. Oh my God, you're so right. And they are so wrong. We have to deal with that as well. And I think a lot of us also feel at times that yes, this is part of our mission as an institution of higher education to educate around civil discourse, but in some ways it's also too late. If we have 18 year olds landing at UC Berkeley who are extremely smart and well-educated, who don't know about the First Amendment, who've never engaged in any discussion about civil discourse, who've never thought about di discussing across ideological and political divides, and we're waiting until now as they kind of emerge from these toxic pools created by social media and the polarization in our society, I think we're too late. Yeah. I, and I'm not saying let us off the hook, but I'm saying we got a bigger problem here, folks. And I've seen firsthand over 20 years that problem get worse and worse. Again, not so much because the university is changing our values or our rules, but because of what's happening in the world out there. And we, we have to look at it holistically, I think. Thank you. I'm going to make one comment and then take the question from the floor or comment from the floor. It's interesting that um, one of the great benefits of being at Berkeley is having the chance to meet people and the like. And so I'll tell an anecdote of when Carolyn and I, after Martin Luther King spoke on the Sprawl Hall steps, we drove him back to San Francisco. We thought, oh, okay, come climb in my car and let's go. Pretty incredible. But King thought a great deal about tactics and consequences and the like. And he made the point on his drive, he focused on breaking state laws. He didn't break federal laws because his strategy, break a state law, because then you had the Supreme Court having a much greater chance that they would overturn that state law. 